Started. My name is Lindsay Wenzel, and I am one of the GSAs for the Advisory Council on Underwater Archaeology. Today, we're going to be hosting our spring virtual panel, which is a continuation of the discussion we started at SHA in January. Um, I'm joined physically with the other GSA, Allison Ropp, as well as GSAs Alicia Johnson and Stephanie Sterling in the chat. Oh, there's Soleil. Hi, Soleil. Um, we've got quite a lot to get through. So we're gonna start off with panelist introductions. And during this time, we're giving each of our panelists about three to five minutes to discuss their work, um, the organizations that they're working with and kind of share a little bit about underwater archeology span in their career. So how about we start with, let's see, oh, hey, Sully. All right, so Hakan, would you like to start? Okay, thank you very much, can you hear me? Okay, excellent. Uh, as Lindsay said, my name is Hakan Reniz. I'm a professor in underwater archaeology at Akdeniz University of Antalya, Turkey. I'm also the director of underwater cultural heritage of CIMAS, the World Underwater Confederation, and the secretary of Commerce Aykuc. And it is very great to see all of you here. Thank you. Thank you, Hakan. Um, let's see, should we move on to Ziad? Hello, uh, thank you, Lindsay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Ziad Morsi, I'm uh, from Egypt. Uh, um, I'm currently the Honor Trust Foundation Liaison Officer in Egypt and a visiting lecturer at the Alexandria Center for Maritime Archaeology at Alexandria University. I just obtained my PhD from the University of Southampton this year. And I've been doing maritime archaeology and underwater culture heritage for almost 15 years now. And I'm, I'm happy to be here. And we'll talk more about this later. Yeah. Thank you, Ziad. Um, yeah. Next up, would we like to hear from Roberto? Hello, everybody. Lindsay, thank you so much for organizing this excellent uh, meeting. Uh, my name is Roberto Junco. I work at uh, SAS-INA, the National Institute of Anthropology and History in Mexico, and um, we have a, a really uh, interesting program of underwater archaeology that uh, we can discuss a little bit later. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. And next, Sole. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, hi, my name is Soledad Solana from Spain. Thank you, Lindsay, for inviting me. Uh, I studied my um, underwater archaeology master in the, university, in the University of Cardiff. I did my master thesis about a uh, Roman shipwreck here. And then I have been participating in, two, in three uh, research projects. And now I am started my, my PhD thesis. Fantastic. Um, next up, let's go with Danielle. I know it's pretty early over there, so we appreciate you being here. Thanks, Lindsay. Yes, good morning, good day, good evening, wherever you are. 
Um, my name is Danielle. I'm the president of the Australasian Institute for Maritime Archaeology, which is an incorporated non-for-profit organisation uh, based in Australia, dedicated to the preservation of underwater cultural heritage. Um, thank you. And last but not least, Caesar. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, my name is Cesar Mahumani. I'm from Mozambique. I'm uh, a lecturer at Edward Mondlan University uh, here in, uh, in Mozambique, and I'm also a PhD uh, student at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Um, well, uh, I'm happy to be here to share with you uh, some projects that we've been developing here in, uh, in Mozambique and also the collaboration we've been establishing with different institution along the, around the world. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have Felipe. Would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Felipe Cerezo. I am professor of underwater archaeology at the University of Cadiz, where I am the coordinator of the Ma Master of Underwater Cultural Heritage and the Program of Underwater Archaeology and Nautical Archaeology at this university. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Wonderful. So to get started, um, I just want to check with our panelists. Does anyone have a presentation that they wanted to give or do we want to do more uh, speaking? Anyone have a... Just raise your hand if you have a presentation so that we can make time for it. Okay, no worries. So let's go ahead and- A few start. slides. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. That's exactly, that's exactly what we wanted. So Ziad, if you're okay with it, why don't we start with you and you can talk a little bit about your program and share that with us. Second. No worries. Screen. Uh, can you see this? It looks great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, so just quick note. Um, I just started working for the HFF, which is Honor Frost Foundation. Um, it's a foundation that was established in 2011, and I'm I'm just I'm gonna give you like a brief. Uh, presentation about the foundation. Um, uh, the foundation has been uh, my main support through my journey during DHD and a number of my projects. And now I am currently employed at the foundation. Um, so briefly, uh, Honor Frost, uh, she is a leader, used to be a leader of uh, maritime archaeology, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean. She was born in Cyprus in 1917. And uh, she was a, a ballet uh, designer and artist until the 50s when she started uh, as a pioneer in maritime archaeology, um, working with a, a large number of different underwater archaeological uh, sites in the Eastern Mediterranean, mainly in Turkey, like in Cape Ledonia, um, and also in Tyre and Sidon and Diplos. And in Alexandria, my hometown, and of course in Marsala, uh, in Sicily, and she was uh, had a particular interest in anchors and harbors, and uh, she helped in the founding of the Council for um, Nautical Archaeology and the International Journal of uh, Nautical Archaeology that most of us uh, know of. Um, uh, Honor Frost uh, first worked in, in Alexandria in 1975 with a local diver and a pioneer in underwater archaeology in Alexandria, Kamel Ustadet. He wasn't an archaeologist at all. Uh, he was a diver and he started uh, locating a number of underwater finds in the eastern harbor of Alexandria or the, the Portus Magnus or the, the great harbor of ancient city of Alexandria. And then he reached out to the UNESCO um, to send uh, somebody who's an expert in underwater archaeology to help him recording all these different finds. And then the UNESCO sent uh, honor in 1975. And since 1975 until the 1990s and uh, early 2000, honor have been repeatedly visiting uh, Alexandria uh, to dive on the site. And she helped pitching the first um, uh, underwater drawing of the site of the ancient lighthouse of Alexandria. 
at the foundation currently, after uh, Honors passed away in 2011, and in her will, um, she consolidated all of her money, all of her wealth, into the establishment of a foundation with the mission to promote the advancement and research uh, in maritime archaeology and in underwater culture heritage with a specific focus on Eastern Mediterranean, especially uh, Lebanon, Syria, Cyprus, and Egypt. And um, since uh, 2011 until now, uh, almost 11 years, uh, right now, or 12 years, uh, the foundation has been funding a number of projects, um, not just in the Eastern Mediterranean, but also in around the world uh, that is promoting uh, and the advancement of research in maritime archaeology. Uh, but also there are uh, specific trainings and specific bursaries for students from the region, um, uh, like uh, um, workshops and seminars and attending trainings and different aspects of trainings that are given um, in, internationally. Um, currently, we uh, have a base in London um, where the main uh, steering committee uh, exists, uh, but also we have an office in Lebanon um, that under um, uh, Dr. Uh, Lucy Saman, who is the director of the Honor Cross Foundation Lebanon currently, and I am the latest um, person in the team joining the team of HFF in Egypt as the liaison officer uh, in, uh, in the country in Egypt. And the foundation have a number of opportunity, including small grants, large grants, training bursaries, field work bursaries, uh, archive fellowship, scholarships, and open access uh, awards. Um, it is mainly focusing on the Eastern Mediterranean, but it's not exclusively uh, focused on the Eastern Mediterranean. So people who are not from the uh, four countries that I've listed can apply for projects within the Eastern Mediterranean region. And uh, of course, we have a number of engagement uh, platforms. Uh, we have a, a podcast series called Dive and Dig. Uh, we have a number of publication, uh, both general and research series with short reports that are also available online on uh, our website. And uh, of course, we have a large social media presence right now across uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter. And we are trying to reach out more to um, both uh, professional uh, underwater archaeologists and uh, the public. Um, and that's quickly an overview of the Honor Frost Foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Siad. Um, how about next? Caesar, is it okay if you go next? Oh yeah, yes, um, I can go next. Let me uh, just share my screen. Throw that on you. Okay, can you see my screen now? Looks great. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm gonna try to make the story short. So um, my name is Cesar Mahomani. I'm a PhD uh, candidate at the University of Pretoria in, in South Africa. Uh, I'm employed at the Department of Archaeology and Anthropology from Edward Mundland University in, uh, in Maputo, uh, where I work as a, a lecturer in the subject on maritime, maritime ecology. So um, this university, the Edward Mundland University, is one of the first uh, public university that was established in Mozambique in 1970s. And since then, it had uh, a department which was a uh, department of archaeology and anthropology that was established around the 1980s. And it was the main uh, department responsible for conducting most of the archaeological uh, research along, along the, the country. Um, one of the most important projects that were conducted by this department was in, uh, in the 90s 
where uh, Professor Ricardo Duarte and his colleagues uh, from the department and also some uh, Swedish colleagues, they conducted some research along the northern area of Mozambique, where they found a lot of um, underwater sites, especially in, in Mozambique Island, where we find a lot of uh, underwater, underwater sites. So since then, Mozambique Island had become a priority in researching all of this heritage. But unfortunately, in the uh, in the early uh, 2000, um, the Mozambican government decided to sign a contract with a, a treasure hunting company. So since then, most of the academic research was established. I mean, was stopped here in the, in the northern Mozambique. Professional archaeologists they couldn't do any work in this in this area because of that uh, exclusivity of the contract that was signed with the, the treasure hunters. After 14 years of this uh, pillage and salvage on, uh, on this heritage, and because of the pressure established by the university um, colleagues from different uh, countries and also uh, UNESCO, uh, it came to prove that the, the, the activities that were being carried out by this treasure hunting uh, company were very detrimental to, to the heritage. So the government decided to cancel that contract and pointed the Department of Archaeology and Anthropology as the main uh, institution that was supposed where we're going to conduct research in in northern Mozambique, but also in the in the whole the Mozambican coast. So since 2015, uh, we've been conducting a lot of activities in Mozambique Island, especially monitoring all the the, the sites that were damaged by the treasure hunters and uh, having uh, conserving the, the collections that were collected and uh, all of the materials. So in 2018, we have uh, established here a center, uh, which is a center of archaeology research and resources, Big Island, which is responsible for um, the conservation of the underwater cultural heritage around Mozambique Island, but also in the northern area of Mozambique. So it's kind of a, a branch of our, our university, our department. And we have been also training local community in uh, diving activities, but also has basic technicians working with, uh, with archeo and, uh, maritime archaeology, but also land archaeology and treating different uh, collections that are found uh, along the wrecks, but also uh, on land as well. So this center, has developed so many uh, training to this far, uh, providing some uh, dive trainings to the community, getting them involved into the maritime archaeology, so they become uh, the first eye on the on the on the heritage that is uh, on Mozambique Island. So along these uh, all these uh, years, we've been working with different projects, especially the slave rock project that was that have been working in Mozambique for at least the last uh, seven to eight years, if, if I'm not wrong. Uh, this uh, project has been responsible for conducting training with the student. I was one of the person that benefited from the training from this project, this LEVRAC project, and also some of my, of my colleagues. Uh, UNESCO has also uh, conducting some projects here. In 2019, we hosted a regional training in Mozambique where uh, students from different countries, uh, African countries, came to Mozambique Island and we had um, a training here. We had also the opportunity to have this grant from the uh, ambassador's uh, grant for cultural preservation. Part of this uh, grant was also used to build this, uh, the center in the fortress and also help establishing the, the, the monitoring uh, and also the conservation of most of the shipwreck. The um, this, this Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency is one of the institutions in the last years that have been joining uh, with project. They are now funding two PhDs projects uh, here in Northern Mozambique and also a master project on maritime archaeology. Uh, so there are three students now. I'm one of them benefiting from the, the grant from CEDA-SAREC. 
the rising from the depth as well as one of the projects that have been conducting some work here uh, in Mozambique Island, developing some geophysical um, um, surveys along the along Mozambique Island, and also a project from the Octopus Foundation that we basically document some of the sites and part of the project are also available uh, online. So this is just some some of the projects that have been uh, joining here the island in the last few years that are dealing with maritime uh, archaeology and also the preservation of this important heritage that is uh, located in northern in northern Mozambique. So um, this is some of the the few slides I had to share to share with you. Obviously, there is a, a lot uh, of projects going on and activities uh, here in Mozambique that I would be glad to share with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Caesar. Um, next up, we have Hakan Onis from Akdeniz University in Turkey. Okay, uh, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to congratulate Ziad for the new duty. Uh, and again, it is very perfect to see good friends who uh, died with me last year, including Cesar. Um, okay, I would like to talk on our activities, what we are doing on underwater archaeology as Actims University. Uh, the first of all, we have three uh, departments in Actinus University. Uh, we have an underwater research center. Uh, we have a department related to underwater cultural heritage protection, and we have a master program on underwater cultural heritage. Now we have 35 master students and uh, uh, separately 13 uh, graduated master students too. Uh, we are the, one of the founders of UNESCO Unity in Underwater Archaeology Network. And between 2012 to 2015, I was the coordinator of the network. And as you know, about 42 universities from the world are uh, the members of Unity Win Network. And we are doing a lot of uh, good job, uh, especially collaborations on our field. Um, ICOMO's International Committee of Underwater Cultural Heritage is another uh, institution is very active on underwater cultural heritage in the world. Totally, we have 56 members, about 45 countries. Uh, and you can see our last book in the ICOMO's Heritage at Risk series. Uh, another thing that we are doing is the CIMAS, the World Underwater Confederation uh, Committee of Underwater Cultural Heritage, uh, with Emad, uh, our good friend in Egypt, uh, and Gustav from Spain. Uh, we did write a new book related to protection of underwater cultural heritage, mainly focused to CIMAS uh, diving instructors. Uh, in Turkey, we teach 400 scuba diving instructors in last few years, and now they are teaching how to protect underwater cultural heritage to their three two star divers. Now we adapt this training program to CIMAS, and I'm very proud to say that uh, we will see actively a protection approach of CIMAS in the world in uh, a, a few weeks. Uh, on behalf of the Ministry of Culture of Turkey, I am responsible for the coast of Turkish Mediterranean coastline. The cities are Antalya, Mersin, Adana, and Malta. Uh, until now, we have found uh, 335 shipwrecks, and 12 of them have been found last year. And uh, some of you were in the uh, team uh, last year. Uh, sorry, it was 14, not um, 12. Uh, and uh, you see the Turkish Mediterranean coastline map on the screen. 
Uh, it means that uh, there are a lot of uh, racks, but some places have very uh, limited racks uh, because we didn't start uh, to survey there. When we work there, we will probably have uh, more. Uh, these racks, uh, not only the racks of amphoras, they are tile racks. Uh, uh, by the way, when we find since about three years, we are creating 3D dimension uh, uh, jobs with photo scan and similar programs, and this is one of them. Uh, and this is a very beautiful Roman tile rack, uh, uh, and it is accepted to publishing by uh, Journal of Maritime Archaeology. Uh, not only the uh, shipwrecks, we are also working at the coastline, and this is a stone quarry. Uh, two of Spanish friends are also uh, with us, and we are working to publish it. Uh, the most important excavation of us is the Commercial Bronze Age shipwreck excavation. This wreck is, was the oldest wreck ship of the world. It is about 3,500 or 3,600 years old, old, about 200 years older than Fulbrun wreck. But the news is, uh, let's say, when uh, all the uh, guests went, few days later, we start all this one, older than this one. Now we have another wreck, which is about 3,800 years old. And the wreck is came from the coast of Levant to this side. Uh, we didn't publish it. Uh, this uh, picture from the uh, Tumuja Bronze Age uh, wreck, uh, and the type of the ingots, the cargo is copper ingots, and type of the ingots are uh, George Bass Bucos uh, ingot types 1A and 1B, both together. And we are able to date them easily from the Egyptian wall paintings. And not only the wrecks, we are also working on the uh, anchors, and because of the Bronze Age anchors, we are able to understand the Bronze Age sea routes, the, all the Turkish Mediterranean coastline have been used during the Bronze Age by the sailors. But in this time, one point, you can see 25 Bronze Age anchors. They are very similar to the anchors of Ulvun Rek. They have been seen Alara River entrance. Now we are able to say that we also have an unknown Bronze Age harbor in Antalya at the entrance of Alara River. And this is our, we are really proud to um, show this picture that uh, this is one of the biggest underwater archaeology ship of the world. We have, this is a green ship. We are able to use the solar, produce our electricity, produce our hot water. We have a recompression chamber for five persons. Uh, we are using high technology, and this ship is on the sea now. Uh, and next month, we are going to use this ship's uh, abilities. And this is end of my presentation, and thanks to all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hakan. Um, next up, I'd like to invite Sole and Felipe. Are you guys doing presentations together or separate? Up to you. Thank you. Uh, we're, we are going to make the presentation separated. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. Felipe, what if um, you go? And then Sole, you'll follow. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Can you see? Yeah. All good. Okay. So I'm Felipe Cerezo, professor of underwater archaeology at the University of Cadiz. Uh, I am also the coordinator of the program of nautical underwater archaeology at the University of Cadiz, which is pretty much there <laughs> at the end of the arrow. Um, uh, I, 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 I was I have several slides. I'm going to speak very quickly 
but uh, I, I was to I, I wanted to say that um, underwater archaeology has not been a priority in the university in Spain since the 50s. In Spain, uh, was never been um, underwater archaeology underwater archaeology at the university, but only on several uh, centers, research centers at uh, some administrative uh, regions. Since the uh, 2016, when at the University of Cadiz, we found the, the, the LANIS, the Linea de Archaeología Nautica y Subacuática, the program of nautical and underwater archaeology. And we have uh, here at the university a master's degree and a PhD degree focused on underwater archaeology and maritime archaeology and history. And we have uh, a lot of uh, resources in our university. We have our own ship uh, research vessel, as you can see in the picture, some divers <laughs> jumping in the water. Um, the master is focused on a practical uh, training. We have uh, a lot of different courses, uh, but mainly the most important part is that we made in archives and also under the water. On, on several laboratories. Our fi philosophy is to work theory in, in the university in class, but make all the practical work on the field. And let the student to make their master dissertation and PhD dissertation about these uh, field uh, sessions. Uh, we have several uh, projects. Uh, to to involve a student during the the, the 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 research, and they make part of the team during all the step of the research since the beginning. You know, uh, setting up the the the, the dive uh, logistic, and also during the excavation, record, and conservation of all the materials in our own labs at the University of Cadiz and also enjoying the final party <laughs> every after every every season. Um, we have a strategy uh, focused on research, which is the Proyecto Heracles, which is ending this month, actually, but we hope to have more funding next year, um, with another uh, uh, project focuses on transfer, transfer of knowledge through uh, dissemination activities or through touristic uh, um, activities related to underwater cultural heritage. We have two, uh, three European projects, Creamare, Tide, and Yumar. Each one of them focused Yumar on the training of underwater uh, whites to white underwater uh, people to, to visit underwater uh, sites, to visit shipwrecks. The TIDE project, which is focused on uh, give uh, digital access to underwater cultural heritage through uh, virtual reality glasses and another uh, gadget, another uh, strategies. And Creamare project, which is focused on uh, develop a serious game related with uh, underwater cultural heritage uh, sites. Um, this is a new one. We are starting. It's led by um, the university by um, Paio Bruno from Italy. Um, uh, it's a very interesting project. Um, you can follow us in social media because we are now with an open call, inviting uh, scholars to uh, present the underwater sites to be part of the serious game that we are developing. Um, I just want to, to put some pictures about the works that we are making in several shipwrecks, like the Vallenera shipwreck, which is the the the, 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 the shipwreck that is being working by a student during the master, with a lot of cultural material from different uh, typology that every student can choose whatever they want to 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 study or to research. Um, also. We have some ancient uh, shipwreck. Well, this is the study of uh, the site process forming of the of the site and the dispersion of material using GIAs. And um, uh, also, we are working a lot with um, a virtual reconstruction of underwater objects in order to make uh, uh, some 
to, to, to explore the dimension of uh, non-intrusive te techniques in order to uh, interpret and research some underwater artifacts that are, that are under the sea, as you can see with this canon. Uh, I don't want to take many time to speak about <laughs> all this project because uh, we are, all, all we can do that. Um, this is all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Felipe. Uh, we will follow up with Sole. Sorry, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. I'm sharing my screen. Okay, can you? see the full screen presentation yes it looks great <laughs> okay thank you so much for inviting me uh, it's a pleasure to be here um i guess i'm going to speak about uh, my master thesis and about the projects i have been working since i did my master degree um uh, about the thesis plan that i have just started um, a few months ago. Uh, my master thesis research carried or took took place in the Bay of Algeciras, um, in the south of Spain and in the Strait of Gibraltar. Um, the nautical conditions and the characteristics of the site, and also the um, uh, the working conditions there, um, in uh, follow me to to use the non-intrusive um, methodology uh, uh, defined by the UNESCO con uh, convention. Uh, this is a Roman shipwreck uh, from the second century AD, and the um, the uh, remains are all amphora um, of the same typology, and they these amphora were used uh, to transport the fish sharking products. Um, in the strait. Uh, between other techniques, I used uh, the photogrammetry and the archaeological drawing. Uh, so I get uh, very well trained in those techniques. And after the, um, uh, the interpretation of the data, I found that the, these amphora were a local production from the Bay of Cadiz. Um, and uh, parallels have been also found in land settlements in three um, fish salting factories. So this proves that this is the first underwater archaeological context for amphora of this typology. And um, is a cargo from Cadiz found in Algeciras. So this is um, an evidence of the um, uh, local redistribution trade between both uh, bays. And I think it's related uh, to the importation of empty amphora uh, due to the end of the production of in the potteries of the Bay of Algeciras. Um, to sum up about this, the non-intrusive methodology uh, proves that in this case of, uh, of study, um, have been very successful in achieving uh, a large amount of diagnostic data about uh, this shipwreck in just five dives, and we were a very small team. So this encouraged us to replicate this methodology in other shipwrecks and in other archaeological sites. Um, then after finish my after finishing my master thesis, I started to work in the Heracles project. Um, about it, um, Felipe Cerezo has already spoke. So I just uh, want to say that I am, I have been involved in the in situ documentation, the data processing, and some dissemination work. Above all, I have been in charge of the photogrammetry of the shipwrecks, 
and the drawing of the planimetries from the orthophotos, and then uh, of completing the drawings for, uh, with check dives to correct uh, the interpretation of the naval architecture. I have also participated in other two projects, apart from the Heracles, which have allowed me to improve my methodology. Um, in the Archimayernauta project in Balearic Island, I had the opportunity to carry out digital GPS topography on a Roman shipwreck from the 3rd century AD, as well as a geophysical survey with the bottom profiler to identify the size of the shipwreck and several anomalies that uh, we have the opportunity to later verify by means of dead speeds. Uh, this was very useful, very useful from an uh, methodological level to learn how to identify and interpret anomalies in the signal in, emitted by the subbottom profiler. Um, the last project is the Aladroque in Cartagena, developed to assess the impact of high energy weather events on the over the underwater cultural heritage. Uh, we carry out several surveys to assess the effect of the heavy rains that uh, carry a lot of uh, rubbish and sediments into the sea. Um, we use the subbottom profiler at different moments of time to understand which areas uh, were being, being dug up or which areas were being buried. Uh, previous geophysical surveys have found several anomalies to check. And in the deeper ones, we used a row. Um, we got the best results in the Cartagena one, Cipric, a Roman Cipric from the uh, late second century BC. Uh, we programmed the cameras to take uh, two pictures per second, but and then put them in, in the row. And because we knew the, orienta we knew the orientation of the Cipric, we were able to tell the row pilot how many meters to go in each heading to cover the site. After four attempts, we got the photogrammetry of the of the site. Um, we can see how the amphoras are falling out of the tumulus. Um, many lobsters living in them. And also a lot of garbage, plastics, ropes, chains that have broken the, the amphora. This is just the preliminary documentation. We have to improve it. So after my experience in, in these projects, I decided to start my PhD thesis, thesis to survey the underwater cultural heritage in the state of Gibraltar, because this location provides a highly interesting opportunity to undertake the study of a, a society's interaction with the sea. Uh, I aim to replicate the methodology used in previous research um, to, to study the underwater remains from prehistoric times to the end of antiquity. But for the moment, I have only reviewed the available literature. Um, and this is, these are the preliminary results. I managed to locate 165 underwater archaeological sites. Um, I have done a first analysis um, classifying the information according to the criteria that this is just the beginning of a long path. <laughs> Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sole. Um, next up, we have Dr. Roberto Junco to help give us a quick presentation. Thank you, Lindsay. So I will introduce a little bit uh, our organization in Mexico. It's uh, the Subdirección de Arqueología Subacuática, SAS. Um, it is part of the National Institute of Anthropology and History, which is the governing body of uh, archaeology in Mexico. Our office started uh, way back in 1980 with our pioneer archaeologist Pilar Luna, Regrena, who fought very hard to create the area within the Institute and take care of the underwater cultural heritage of Mexico. So I'm putting a little link in the, in the in the chat so that you guys can access our web page. I didn't uh, put up a presentation. I want to keep it short so that the time is for everybody to present their, their organizations. So basically what we do is we have uh, different projects that uh, take care of uh, the prehistory in Mexico, 
uh, we're talking about mainly the sinkholes in the Yucatan, but also uh, underwater sites of the coast of Baja California, where we have um, contexts that are over 7,000 years old, no? in including a skeleton of uh, 13,000 years old, several of 10,000, 8,000 years old. So that's one of uh, the aspects of the projects that, that we deal with. We have the pre-Hispanic aspects. Um, we take care there of the relationship between the people that inhabited the territory and their relationship to uh, water bodies, especially lakes, uh, rivers. And so that's also part of the things that we do. There's certainly the colonial um, aspect um, where we take care mostly of ships, but also ports. Uh, there's that maritime component there. Um, 19th century uh, ships as well, and 20th century ships, some of which are quite important to our national history, etc. So our projects run that large of a time scale. Also geographically, we take care from the way north to the south, you know, to the Yucatan, um, trying to, to, to do an inventory of all the underwater sites in Mexico. You know, that's one of our, our things. Um, Mexico has been a signatory of the UNESCO Convention since, since 2004, and our office works very close with uh, UNESCO to promote those values and implement them in our research and elsewhere. Um, but there's other things that we do as well. We do a lot of rescue and salvage. For, for example, we're doing now a, a gas dock in the Gulf of Mexico, a 700 kilometer uh, gas dock. We're working with the companies to ensure that there's no harm to the uh, cultural heritage. Uh, we do also legislation. Um, we take care of uh, promoting that the laws uh, abide to um, the UNESCO standards and also the best protection of the cultural heritage. And of course, we also do a lot of public outreach, uh, diffusion, divulgation. Um, we do uh, museums, both uh, national museums, local museums and community museums, publications, talks, um, different uh, strategies to get the message out there to protect underwater cultural heritage. Uh, we also do social work. You know, in, in their case, we've done a couple of expeditions to locate disappeared people from our uh, uh, problems that we have here in Mexico, etc. cetera. No? But also talks in um, old people or young kids, you know, like we do this kind of thing also. No? We take very seriously doing uh, social work. Um, and we also foster the exchange with uh, international uh, communities. Um, we help other countries when needed uh, with our uh, the experience that we've managed to accumulate over the years. Um, we also do some recuperation of objects through Facebook when we find somebody selling things that they shouldn't be selling. Um, so we reach out to them and try to recuperate. And um, overall, we do a lot of government uh, policy, implementing um, things for the tourism industry, et cetera. So it's, that's our office. It's a little bit of uh, management of underwater cultural heritage for the Mexican government. Um, and well, that's basically what we do. And we love to uh, cooperate internationally. Um, so uh, we're here. If you guys need anything, uh, let us know. I left there our webpage and you, we can be reached uh, through that webpage if you have any questions. And thank you so much, Lindsay. Thank you so much, Roberta. Um, next up, we have one of our newest ACUA board members, Dr. Connie Kelleher. Honey, can you hear us? Oh, okay. can you hear me now? Yes, now we got gotcha. you. Okay, it doesn't seem to want to let me share. Um, how do I share Zoom? Uh, Go down to the bottom of the screen. And there should be a share button in the center. Um, okay. Uh,
Okay, let me see if I can share. Sorry about this. Oh yeah, here we go. Okay. Can you see that? We can. Okay. Let's see if I can put it on to full. Okay. Uh, ladies. Okay. Right. Uh, the National Monument Services is uh, who I work for. Um, I'm senior archaeologist in the National Monument Service. And um, the NMS, as we shorten it to, is the main state organization for really the protection of our archaeological heritage, both on land and underwater. Um, we're within the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage currently, but that's subject to change whenever there's a new government, unless they don't decide to change it, but usually they do. So we could end up in different departments, but the National Monument Service itself stays the same. Um, our primary role is to essentially manage, protect and promote archaeology. And we do that in two ways. Um, through our stat statutory functions as consultees and regulators um, um, under our legislation, which is our National Monuments Act, and they're quite strong legislation um, in regard to our monuments. Um, and we have a lot of um, legal backing for the um, for regulating through the planning um, planning uh, legislation as well. So we vet uh, planning applications and things like that. And then we are very much in, involved in um, public awareness raising and uh, the appreciation of the value and importance of our heritage through either funding or engagement uh, with cross-departmental engagement or institutional engagement, or indeed through funding, as I say. Our setup within the National Monument Service is we have a director and the administrative staff, and then we have um, different levels of archaeologists, uh, our chief archaeologists, and then senior archaeologists and grade three archaeologists, and we also have data managers. So that's kind of how the National Monument Service is set up. And nationally, um, oh dear. Uh, sorry, I seem to have frozen. Are you, can you still hear me? We can still hear you. It's on um, the administrative and archaeological structure slide. Yeah. There we go. Oh, oh no. There okay. Go. Uh, the structure of, and this is where my work comes in, um, uh, the National Monument Service has a number of different units. Um, you can see them listed there. I won't go into them, but the three units I would be involved with is the licensing and planning unit, which I manage with a team of 10 archaeologists. And um, I'm also involved with the World Heritage Unit. Um, I'm senior archaeological advisor for one of our World Heritage sites. And then the underwater archaeology unit, of course, which is our main underwater cultural heritage unit. Um, and I'm formed part of the dive team there. From a licensing and planning where our statutory role comes in um, is we are statutory consultees. Um, our minister is. So any license, any planning applications or development applications for the country are sent to us as well for vetting. So our um, licensing and planning team would look at all of those um, from around the country and assess them from an archeological per perspective and impacts on archeology. span And then we have a licensing system that we also um, um, oversee and there are anything from excavation licenses, everything is regulated in Ireland. So you, if you want to do any archeology, span you have to have a license to do so, whether it's an excavation license, detection device license, dive licenses. And then we have ministerial consents for anything uh, that might be in um, world, world heritage or state care or to do with the roads, which is ministerial direction. So the National Monument Service is the body that um, um, administers all of those. From a world heritage perspective, we have two world heritage sites in the south of Ireland, um, Bruna Boyne, which is our Bend of the Boyne ensemble sites uh, up in the northeast of the country. And then Skellig Behil or Skellig Michael, which is our World Heritage Site off the southwest coast, and that's the one that I um, um, I I'm senior archaeologist for, and um, we collaborate with our colleagues in another department in the Office of Public Works for um, the management and protection of that island and the um, 
um, overseeing the World Heritage Site and the UNESCO requirements for that site. This is just a view of Skellig Michael. It's, it's a site that has a medieval monastery um, on it on the North Peak, and this is the South Peak. It's two peaks um, comprising the island. You can see all the terraces here and little oratories, and these are the little beehive huts. But it also has um, historical archaeology on it on the other side, on the south side of the island, which is two um, lighthouses from the um, early 19th century, really fine examples of those. You can see the upper one here, and they're connected by this amazing um, um, winding lighthouse road. So we have a medieval, uh, early medieval monastery on one side of the island, and we have historical archaeology on the other side of the island. So it all forms part of our um, World Heritage Site. And then um, my work also involves me with the Underwater Archaeology Unit. And um, I form part of the dive team and I'm dive safety officer. And the underwater unit has quite a wide brief, um, everything from survey and investigation and undertaking underwater um, excavations. This You see one image here of our work in 2015 on uh, one of the Ar Spanish Armada shipwreck sites in the Northwest. And um, we upkeep and, and carry on on an ongoing basis, the quantification of shipwrecks as part of our wreck inventory database. And you see the online version here that you can access, as I say, online, the wreck viewer. Um, the underwater unit also has a licensing brief. So any, um, any developments that would have an underwater impact, such as offshore wind farms or, or dredging, marine dredgings or anything like that, the underwater unit would be the ones that would oversee the assessment of those applications and the licensing requirements for those. Uh, from a treasure hunting uh, perspective or salvage, maybe um, um, a non-licensed salvage or non-permitted salvage operations, we would have an enforcement brief and regulation in that respect. We're also beginning to look at climate change impacts on our wrecks, both coastal wrecks and um, offshore wrecks, to get build up a, a kind of a, a database on the impacts from our from the climate change perspective. We do quite a bit of outreach, particularly with fishermen and the recreational diving or avocational diving community, um, really liaising with with them on um, maybe material that might come up in the fishing nets that happens quite a bit or with our co our diving colleagues um, who liaise with us when they are their technical divers so they would do a lot of the deep water shipwrecks that we can't get to um, through our diving so we liaise with them in that respect and we have brought out a, couple, a number of publications and uh, the most recent one is the, that on the Lusitania which is also in our territorial waters probably one of our, our most high profile shipwrecks and we would liaise with um, with divers who wish to dive that from a recreational perspective it's all a kind of a visual no touch diving and also with the owners of the of the Lusitania so their permission would be sought and we would insist on that as conditions of any license for our uh, recreational diving on that. And currently we are um, beginning to ramp up um, working towards the ratification of the understanding the process of ratification. Currently we have a new um, um, national monuments um, legislation, hopefully that's going to be en enacted next year, which is the Historic and Archaeological Heritage Bill. Um, which should come out, as I say, in early 2024. And that will allow us finally, after many years, many decades, I should say, um, to ratify the UNESCO Convention, which we are absolutely delighted uh, because we had to change some domestic law and the new bill will allow us to do that. So we're very much getting our heads around the process at the moment so that when the bill is enacted, we will be able to, in a sense, hit the ground running with uh, going into ratification. So, so thank you very much. That's kind of a very quick overview of what I do and what we do. Wonderful. Thank you, Connie. Um, last but not least, we have Danielle Wilkinson. Hello, Lindsay. Thank you. Um, I did have some slides to present, but they stopped working and it wasn't something I could solve at 4.30 in the morning. So apologies. I'll just do a, a verbal um, overview and I'll keep it fairly brief. 
Um, before I dive in, I'd like to acknowledge all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander traditional owners and recognise their continuing connection to land, sea, culture and community. I'm joining you from the land of the Bunurong people. I pay my respects to their elders past and present, and I extend that respect to all of the First Nations peoples and elders who are joining us today. Um, I also want to thank the panellists that preceded me. You work at some fantastic places and do amazing work. I am in awe of all of you. Um, AMA is not an academic or a research institution, rather we're just a membership of people that have an interest in maritime archaeology and we're all volunteers within AMA. Um, AMA was established in 1982, so we've just had our 40th birthday. Um, our objectives are to support and undertake research and preservation within the field of maritime archaeology and to publish the results of that work. Um, we do this by sponsoring some work throughout Australia, Asia uh, and the Indian and Pacific Ocean regions. And we also work closely with and provide advice to state, territory and federal um, governments and regulators within Australia. Um, we are also one of the accredited non-government agencies under the UNESCO 2001 Convention and Australia is hopefully a year or two away from ratifying that one finally. So uh, the membership of AMA includes academics, consultants, regulators, divers, anyone with an interest um, across the Australasian region. Um, but the sort of doers and drivers behind AMA is a, an executive committee of six people um, and a council of 20 people. And then we have uh, over a dozen administrative positions as well. And like I said, we're all volunteers. Our outputs each year include an annual peer reviewed journal, which is the Australasian Journal for Maritime Archaeology. We also hold an annual conference. Um, and this year, that conference is joint with the um, with ECOCH, the International uh, Committee um, on Underwater Cultural Heritage. And it's being held right after the ECOMOS General Assembly in Sydney. So if anyone's in Australia for that event, please hang, hang around for another week and come to our AIM conference in Canberra. We also have a, a little annual scholarship to help fund mostly student-driven research projects in Australia. Uh, we have a quarterly newsletter, monthly member meetings, and we also run a version of the Nautical Archaeological Society training that they're a UK based training organisation. And we have the sort of Australian version of that that we provide in Australia as well. My personal experience is in more cultural heritage management. So I've worked in Into our maritime industry. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Danielle. All right, so that is a little introduction to all of our panelists. We want to use the last 30 or so minutes of our session to transition more into a discussion base. And we have a couple of questions, but I'm going to go ahead and open up the chat. So if you do have any questions for our panelists, please put them in the chat so that we can address them. Let's see. There we go. All right, so it should be open now. Um, anyways, this panel is actually a continuation of a discussion we started at SHA in January. And one of the questions that really got a lot of conversation flowing was talking about how in the last few years, um, the field has really been dominated by increasingly digital methods. So I open this question to the floor. Um, how do you think that this increasingly digital age has impacted international relations within the field of underwater archeology? span and we'll just go ahead if anyone has thoughts, you're welcome to raise your hand or talk out, whatever works best. <laughs> well, I might keep talking uh, if, if no one else minds. Um, I think being right down in the very bottom of the world, moving towards more digital methods in communicating and holding events has really broadened the number of people that can engage with Australian archaeology, but it's also really helped Australian archaeologists engage with um, communities overseas and, you know, at different institutions. Um, and I feel like that's has obvious benefits for knowledge sharing um, and, and, and opportunities. So it, it's felt to me down in Australia, like the world has become a lot smaller and easier to connect with 
thanks to yeah all, all the different online technologies but also in terms of data sharing as well so um, in Australia we're veering towards more focus on submerged landscapes rather than shipwrecks and the research there involves you know terabytes of data in terms of geophysics and, and geoarchaeology geotech uh, type data um, and I feel like it's a strength that we can transfer that data electronically to someone on the other side of the world to help interpret um, and I'm sure we'll be relying more and more on the different expertise that is available overseas that we don't yet have the capacity in Australia for but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be learning very rapidly, but yeah, I'm sure we'll be leaning on a lot of our international colleagues to, to assist in studies based in Australia. Any other thoughts on this? I feel like I may have seen a hand from Ziad. Yeah, uh, well, um, just to follow up on what Danielle was saying, it's, uh, again, it's uh, our work is a bit hard because a lot of the people who, uh, most of the people in the world cannot see underwater archaeology but now with the digital age and with the digital tools we can easily transfer our sites that are non-accessible for 95 percent of the global uh, uh, person and uh, giving it to them or giving them the opportunity to visit our site and share the the same knowledge and pattern to underwater culture heritage. so I see uh, the there is a big development, especially in the last five, six years in visualizing and uh, what Philippe uh, presented about uh, trying to visualize the underwater artifacts into a more comprehended way, um, a, a way that other people who are not archaeologists or even don't have enough experience to understand the finds underwater, they can actually appreciate it and also gain information from it. So, so then they would be able to actually have more understanding of underwater archaeology. And I think that will help in eventually the protection of underwater cultural heritage in different parts of the world. So yeah, definitely uh, the, the digital tools is, is a very helpful um, thing in our field right now, especially for dissemination, both for um people who are experts and to the members of the public Hakan? yeah actually i also want to add something to daniel and ziad uh, you know the technology is amazing uh, they are using rovs now uh, they have three rovs in the ship with the manipulators but what we are doing uh, we are connecting to the uh, world from the deep while we are excavating to our community excavation, you know, we are monitoring to divers who are working in the water. We come until the deep of the diver while, while he is or she is working there. And we are reflecting the same second to all over the world. Like the surgery operations, now we are able to share our works in the water to the world. Any other thoughts? Felipe? I think I can't hear you. <laughs> no. you, you. You missed the best part of the speech. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, this is really, I, I agree with everyone. Um, but also thinking in teaching. Uh, for our students, we are using these technologies to give them uh, a direct contact with underwater archaeology because usually we we learn with with these books, these maps, and this this analogic data that is difficult to connect. What is what, what is real in under the water? Not, and we are doing pr pretty much the same that Hakan has presented. Not, uh, with we have an streaming boy that we call it that is connected with, with Wi-Fi to internet and with four cameras under the water and other sensors to stream information, to stream underwater site, but mainly to stream the what archaeologists do, because this is important. This is not a hobby. This is not, this is science. And we have to defend this part. And also at the universities, we have to communicate this also for our college, because sometimes we speak with another 
colleagues from another uh, from medieval history and they think that we 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 are chasing treasure but not we are making history Are there any more thoughts i don't want to move on to the next question too quick all right so um moving on what are some ways that you guys think that we can help facilitate better international collaborations or relations? Like, are there things that you've done in your own organizations that have helped to bring more diverse crews together? Any any stories like that? I'll just open it up to everybody. Oh, actually, um, before that, let's go to the chat. We have a question. Uh, I believe this is for Danielle or anyone. I just saw Australia. <laughs> uh, particularly when it comes to submerged landscapes in areas like Australia, how do you think about the intersection between underwater archaeology and Aboriginal or Indigenous rights? So we can open that up to everybody. Um, I have a lot of thoughts in this area because it is a very changing, growing space, you know, very actively at the moment. Um, I think that underwater archaeology, though, can very much empower Aboriginal um, traditional owner groups. A lot of them are still connected to their water country, to their, to their country. They don't see a, a line between the land and the sea. It's one continuous landscape. And I think by bringing some focus to um, yeah, the landscape offshore and helping traditional owners reconnect with that country, just touching ba uh, back, back just a minute about visualising the sites underwater and the landscapes underwater. Um, it's really empowering to put together those visualisations and give them to traditional owners who can then essentially walk landscapes that their ancestors walked 16,000 years ago and see features underwater that are still within their storylines. Um, it's it's hugely empowering. So um, the, the legislative space is still a little bit tricky and we're doing our best to work through that and make it as um, seamless and, um, you know, promote as much as, as much protection as possible and also give um, Aboriginal groups the say over how their country is treated, if there's heritage sites, how they're to be managed. Um, but yeah, it's very much a space we're learning in at the moment with a lot of a lot of opportunity for, for research, but also to empower um, Aboriginal groups in, in reconnecting with their sea country. I hope that answered your question, Savannah. I'm interested to hear if anyone else has any thoughts on that, though, um, if anyone has any experience with that internationally, because we are very much learning. Oh, Bonnie. Um, just just something that's cropped up kind of lately with with on our side, um, because we don't well, we do have indigenous culture or our um or I suppose our tra traveler culture, but it, it's slightly different from um kind of the general view of indigenous, you know, native native First Nations or whatever, but um, what we're involved in this legacy project to do with climate change actually and world heritage at the moment and what's coming across uh, through our engagement here um, with other colleagues in world heritage sites around the world is how, uh, and it's very enlightening for the likes of me because it's, uh, you don't realize you think about things a certain way and you can be sometimes very close minded without you meaning it to be. Um, and uh, I suppose the best way of putting it is very Western view of it, but um, from listening to other colleagues around the world and they explaining and they themselves being indigenous uh, First Nations and their view of how they approach their heritage and the way they view would be trying to explain about the values and attributes of a site and their sense of values and attributes can be totally different to what my sense of a value and an attribute would be. And and I think it's really fascinating. So it's kind of opening my mind to thinking differently about what are the values of um, heritage. And it, it really brings home the whole intangible view of things as much as the tangible. And as archaeologists, we, we I suppose, first and foremost, we tend to look at the tangible. Um, but it's really important to bear in mind, to me anyway, now, and open it up to intangibles and different ways of looking at it. So 
that's what I've learned in the very short time I've been part of this project, which is only a couple of months, but it's been really enlightening from that perspective. We've got another question in the chat, if you want to take a look. Um, it says, I'm very interested in the field of underwater archaeology, but I wonder if I should learn diving to help me as a researcher in this field. Um, this might be a good kind of segue to talking to emerging technologies, if anyone has any thoughts. Sole? Actually, I can say something about them, of course. I don't know Ahmed is an archaeologist or not, but even if they are archaeologists, just diving is not enough. But this is good for the beginning, you know. Underwater archaeology is doesn't mean that diver are archaeologists. In Turkey, the advice to archaeology students first they have to graduate from the bachelor degree on archaeology, and they have to come to a master degree on underwater archaeology. So this is the best way to the beginning, actually. So you've got your hand up. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, in fact, my hand was related to the previous question. <laughs> but um, following the, the words of Hakan, I think the diving is important, but it's not just uh, just diving. We are archaeologists. And also, I, I would say scientific diving. I, I have been working with several people just be beginners divers and it's not the same dive as work underwater. Um, uh, ah, I, I, I raised my hand uh, related to your question, uh, your previous uh, question about the international relations uh, thanks to the um, new technologies and so on. And I can say that uh, I have more uh, contact more links with underwater archaeologists from um, outside Spain. Uh, and this is uh, more than inside Spain, I mean. And this is thanks to the new technologies. I think that um, events like, like this one, for example, or some uh, conference that uh, uh, are online uh, are the best the better opportunities to to make links. For example, in the early career um, <laughs> stage that I am there, I have been um, I have I have met many people in the same stage that I am, and this is thanks of um, um, initiatives like this one. For example, in the University of Hamburg. They did the Mare Hamburg, and they, this is lectures just for uh, early career. Um, there are several symposium and congress that are for uh, early career. And um, in my stage, we are making the links with things like this, and this is just thanks to the new technology. Caesar. Um, yes, uh, I would like to make some comments on the previous questions that were raised here. Uh, first, this one that he was, uh, I think it's Ahmed, was asking about the uh, underwater archaeologist, if he really has to be a diver. I mean, as my other colleagues have said, I mean, diving is, is just a, a tool we use to get access to, to the site, right? But there is a lot of other means we can use to still study the sites. For instance, Sole on her presentation, she was showing different models that were, I mean, she was producing. Someone else can pick those data and keep studying those, those material without diving on those sites. So you see there the potential also of uh, technology, how it is important, not only on collecting data with a very limited time and then sitting down and analyzing, they will think and conducting a whole, a whole study uh, from there. So uh, I would also, uh, I wanted to comment on that, but also on your question related to the international uh, collaboration and also through through technology. I mean, it's it's really easy today to get in touch with 
with everyone all over all over the world. I mean, we've been here uh, showing different uh, cases in our countries thanks to the technology. So we're also learning here from different realities, different perspectives on how uh, maritime archaeology is carried out in different in different countries. But um, I think there is also something uh, very important here that goes uh, beyond this collaboration or interaction that we have online, which is the practical aspects. You know, we've been talking here about um, you know trainings that have been carried out in Africa or in Latin America or in uh, the Hispanic area, whatever. Um, sometimes my 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 feeling is that this this training or these field works they are very you know concentrated on specific region you know the um, the training for instance we had last on last summer with Hakan it was a great experience because we had people from different contexts you know sitting down seeing how project can be can be conducted on a different perspective. At my, to me that was a different experience on looking to things how they can be done on that context, you know. So being involved on that on that context exposed me to a different reality. So I think that uh, this collaboration is something that also has to come more practical. Having people from different contexts or from different reality integrated in project on other on other geographical areas can also give us a broader view of how methodologies are applied on how uh, the maritime archaeology the theoretical aspect and how how we see all of these all of these elements so uh, i think there is also a need to go beyond the i mean sitting down on a screen and having these discussions but looking uh what the practical elements means i mean uh for instance at the african context sometimes if we talk about um technologies and all these other aspects, it can be somehow um, a challenge, you know, because we don't really have access to cutting edge technology. You know, sometimes we do um, our research or um, the basic uh, surveys with, uh, I mean, very uh, few uh, tools that we have, we have access, access to them. Uh, I don't know how many of you here have had experience, for instance, of diving on a Dow boat, you know, like a wooden boat, which is used to put all your gear, prepare your stuff and diving on a side, documenting and all this, all these things. So it is a different, a different experience expose you or has as a scientist to other, other contexts and also seeing the challenges and also, of course, the benefits from that. So I think this collaboration is something that has to go beyond, I mean, sending emails or seeing, uh, exchanging this, this data. Yes, it is important, but looking to these realities, feeling those realities, I think is also something that it's important. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to add to what uh, Cesar you said. It enriches us as human beings, this uh, exchange of uh, cultures. And I think that's super important because beyond uh, science, you know, we're human beings and we are the ones that make the science. So if we have this experience, it just uh, makes us more whole as human beings. And uh, so those countries, those organizations that have money have to procure the resources to, to, to facilitate this exchange. You know? And sometimes it's so, some countries that have the upper hand, sometimes it's other countries. And um, so it'd be good that, that we continue this, this energy of collaboration. All right, so we have a couple of minutes left for some final thoughts or one final question. Um, anybody have anything that come to mind? <laughs> see. Um, I'm curious, what's one thing that we can do to help improve those relations and collaborations? Is there any like any measurables or specific things that we can do um, to help move towards that? If anyone has any thoughts. Stephanie is wasting. Well, um, if I can. Okay, so this is one of the things I've been discussing with some of my colleagues around the region here. 
on how to move to move forward. And to me, what can help is strengthening this uh, collaboration is uh, putting project into practice, you know, having projects that we sit down for one, two, three months, doing real work on a site, you know, going through all the, the process and not only uh, recovering materials and stuff, but going uh, beyond that lane, interpreting material, displaying elements, and where you have a, a complete project where all the, the you go through all the, the the steps and strength this collaboration so you feel that that project belongs to to everyone so that connects us and makes us more i mean developing other levels of collaboration i think that that's one of the the way forward thank you uh, actually before I mean stephanie probably uh, wish to say something um, you want to type it? Yeah, type. Okay. I think she's going to okay. put it. <laughs> uh, probably we are coming at, uh, to the end. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, as Akin University, which is working at the Turkish Mediterranean coastline, accepts students um, every summer um, for two weeks. And our doors are open to all underwater archaeology students in the way of their professors. Uh, uh, for this summer, we are um, almost full and the permission process uh, are uh, usually on December. And uh, I would like to invite all of you, if you are the master or PhD students on underwater archeology, span to join to our underwater archeology span projects at the Mediterranean coastline of Turkey uh, for 2024. And in this, uh, I would like to say thanks a lot to this great opportunity to meet with you uh, to the Advisory Council on Underwater Archaeology uh, and the students. I definitely recommend that, having done it. Um, it was a great experience. Let's see. So we have one last question in the chat for Felipe. This is from Stephanie says, you mentioned how technology has provided a different way of learning and that students respond well to it, more so sometimes than the traditional approach. On the flip side, do you see a potential issue with the amount of technology being incorporated into learning spaces? And is there hesitation or lack of experience with archival research, for example? And open to everybody. Okay, uh, thank you for the question, Stephanie. Uh, yes, it's an, it's an interesting question. Yes, indeed, we have uh, been using uh, this kind of new technology uh, to in teaching approach with the students. But uh, as Roberto mentioned before, uh, we are human and we have never forget the human uh, approach of our study. So uh, sometimes technology helps and sometimes technology uh, makes uh, a, ma makes difficult to have a direct contact with our subject of a study. And for example, in, in archive uh, research, of course, you can read a lot of documents online, but it's better to go to the archive and find a lot more documents that are not online. And of course, it's good to have a, a virtual museum online but it's better to go inside the museum to the uh, storehouse of the museum. I, I think this is the word. And to, to, to look at the boxes of ancient excavation and make new excavation with, with ancient artifacts. You know? So I, I think that here we have, a, a, we, we have to find a balance between new technologies and technologies and uh, make a traditional approach, but it's the, the, pro, the, 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 the correct approach. We have been doing underwater archaeology or archaeology almost since uh, 100 years. And they didn't have uh, a use of metasay, but they did pretty well um, planimetries of sites. You know? So we can do a lot of things without this new technology, but technology can help a lot to us for us as researchers and also to our students. So, you had your hand up. 
Yes, thank you. I just want to add something about this last question. Um, because we have uh, in the master's underwater archaeology master in the University of Cali, we have um, each year several students um, younger than me. <laughs> what, I, what I mean is that the people, the students nowadays are very used to new technologies and indeed uh, it's easier for them um, to use new technologies than don't use them. For example, for the archive research, uh, as Felipe said, it's better to go to the archive, but the, as the first step to go to the archive, students feel better if they can search on the internet which archives are better for their research. This is just an example, but it happens also in museums and with other kind of research. In, indeed, we have the, the opposite um, scenario that they actually don't know how to look for uh, some kind of bibliography if there is not very well uh, in the internet. So they are used to new technologies and we, if we want them to um, take advantage of their studies, we should use new technologies because of them also. <laughs> All right, so we have one final uh, question. And if we could get like maybe one or two thoughts, what are some opportunities for like grants for grad students or volunteering that you guys would recommend or that you know of? There's there's several uh, opportunities. I, I think one that works fantastic is the AINA. Personally, I, I found it uh, really nice and it's very academic. Uh, but if you can also scratch National Geographic and all those guys, just don't sell your soul to the devil. But uh, there's different different uh, opportunities. I, I would go with Aina, depending on the type of project also, no? of course. You're muted. Honey, oh, there you go. <laughs> Sorry, apologies. Um, yeah, I put it up on the chat there, but um, there is a lack of, well, there's a scarcity of, under, of archaeologists in Ireland, particularly those studying under, or undertaking underwater archaeology um, um, diving wise. And we are offering annual grants to assist those who would like to work in Ireland to undertake their commercial dive training because you have to commercially train in Ireland under our legislation. So, um, we may be um, we may be increasing it this year, so you could get most of the dive training paid for. Um, so it's something to bear in mind. You would have to commit to work in Ireland, obviously. That's the whole pur purpose of it. But keep an eye out for it anyway. All right. Well, on that note, I'd like to say thank you to our panelists and to everyone and to the audience. This has been a great discussion. Um, I know it's really late in some areas and really early in other areas, but it's really great and special. We can all come together um, and kind of a, just have a good discussion. So thank you so much for your time. And we will be posting the recording. So if you miss part of it, we'll make sure to send it out to RSVPs. Um, make sure to check those links that were sent in the chat for all the different organizations that our panelists talked about. And again, thank you so much. We're happy to have you here. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Lindsay. Bye. Thanks. Well Bye. done, Thank you, everyone.